So, uh, some stuff has come up to, to, that helped me understand that we have enough new folks and enough of you that are new on Zoom that we say something around here a lot that probably a number of you haven't uh, heard us talk about the why of it. And so, for, that's one reason. And then I, I have a chance to talk about this to some other folks next week, next Monday, as a matter of fact, back in Washington State. And... Um, I'm going to a conference back there. First conference Vicky and I have been able to get away for since uh, the COVID thing hit. So we're kind of excited about spending some time together and, and uh, heading back and visiting friends and stuff. But uh, I, I'm sure that most of you that have been around a little bit have heard me talk about God being spirit and fire and light and love, love. Well, I'm going to lay out that background in a little bit of detail. And then what I hope that we can have, if I can get through it, in time, I hope that there's uh, some time for thought about the implications of it. I have a few scriptures that are going to point to the implication of thinking that way, but uh, uh, but but I just hope that it uh, it, it stirs some stuff in you because it's it really is something that has changed a lot of the way I think about God and the way I think about living. And just before. Uh, service started today, I uh, was having a conversation with uh, Al, and the idea of being able to live in the expectations of, of who God is and the infinite presence that he brings into our lives, if we miss that out, then we're left to try to figure out how to think about God in some other way. And generally, that causes us to, to lean on either a way of performance or a way of trying to please him through that performance or something. So I'm just going to make the assertion that God is spirit, fire, light, and double love, okay? And I believe that we struggle to understand what we perceive God doing or saying if we don't know who God is. And I would say that's a common situation in life. If you don't know who somebody is, it's really easy to misunderstand why they act at one moment in one way or why they don't act. And, and so it, it's really important. The other thing that makes this super important to me and why I think it's so fundamental, and it's even worth repeating for those of us that have talked about it a lot, um, is Jesus declared this is eternal life. To know, and he was talking, praying to his Father, to know you, the only true God, Father, and Jesus whom you sent. And I know how many people spend the majority of their life and imagination, or maybe not the majority, but the amount of time they spend thinking about eternal life, they spend thinking about it in terms completely other than knowing God. Because we've sold the concept of knowing God as a transaction that you say a prayer for when you, you accept the gospel or whatever. And so, okay, that, yeah, that's when I got to know God. But that's not a relational thing. That's not a, a relational way to think. And I fear that, that when we think about heaven, a lot of times we're thinking about structure, we're thinking about performance, uh, you know, and unfortunately a, a huge amount of the church is thinking about avoiding punishment, avoiding hell, avoiding burning, or whatever. And, and yeah, they're, they're, they're not keen on the fact that God is a consuming fire. You know, most people don't think too hard about that. But anyway, that's why I think this is super critical. So I'm going to power through it. Who exactly is our God. And when I say exactly, I'm not saying that we can know that exhaustively because we know in part, Paul says. And we prophesy in part. We see in part. We see through a glass darkly. So I'm not suggesting that because I've uh, pondered this for a while and found a couple of scriptures that I know exactly who God is. But I don't mind asking the question. Because to ask the question is to position ourselves to come closer to knowing who he is. Jesus reveals the Father. We all agree on that, right? And so he is the one that has the best perspective. Matter of fact, I'm going to show you in just a second. He's the one that has literally almost the only perspective of it. In the New Testament, a lot is said about God. And don't let this next statement freak you out. But a lot of the stuff that is said about God is said about people who don't know him. Now that kind of makes you nervous if you think, what, what about inspiration of the Bible or inerrancy or whatever? 
What about the conversations recorded among the Pharisees? What about the accusations the Pharisees bring against Jesus when he's standing right there in front of them? And when Jesus says, you've never seen his form, talking about his father, or heard his voice. So we got to be a little more focused and a little more intentional about who we, we are learning God to be. And that's what this is about. And that's what started me on this journey, and that's what started Joyland on this journey. And then there's something else that's pretty amazing. As a matter of truth, let me read this to you. As a matter of truth, the Scripture says that only Jesus knows the Father. So let me read this to you. This is in Matthew 11, 25. Starting there, I'll read down the rest of the chapter. At that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for this way was well-pleasing in your sight. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal Him. Now, I think that is a pretty amazing and bold statement. And I think that we have the potential to gain a lot if we will understand the magnitude of that, the exclusivity of that. No one knows the Son except the Father. And he was saying this while having disciples who had followed him for a year or so at this time. And no one knows the Father except the Son. Remember it says that no man has seen God at any time, but the Son, he has revealed him. Now that, when I think, first heard that and heard it emphasized, it made me nervous. It goes, well, then what is this whole thing about knowing Jesus? What is this whole thing about being saved? What is this whole thing about having a relationship? And that's what it's about. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son and those to whom the Son wills to reveal it. So your knowledge of the Father, if you have any, how many of you would, would, without me having emphasized this, would have said, uh, if I'd said, do do you have a knowledge of the Father, a relationship with the Father? How many would have said yes? I would have too. And I believe it's true. But what I believe this scripture tells me is that that comes exclusively as a gift from Jesus. Jesus. And so does the knowledge of the Son come as a gift from the Father. Now, lest you think, and lest I leave you in a position where this seems almost oppressively exclusive, a really famous verse follows this. A verse of blessing and a verse of of gifting. So immediately after Jesus said, no one, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son and anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal Him, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now, I know I lived for probably 45 years of my Christianity before I actually, in my mind, connected those two verses as one following right after the other from the mouth of Jesus in the same paragraph. No one knows the Father except the Son and the one to whom He wills to reveal Him. But then the qualification for who He wills to reveal Him rolls out the red carpet. Come to me, all that are weary, all you that are tired, all you that are burdened, and I will give you rest. 
So this is the beauty of this thing. But it doesn't take away from the fact that knowing who God is is really, really critical. And knowing who he is revealed as by Jesus is, it can't be more critical. It's the pathway to resolve that critical issue. Does that make sense? All right, nod at me or something if that makes some sense. All right, okay. So here's what we discovered a long time ago, or about four years ago, actually. Only four times in the New Testament is the phrase, God is, followed by a noun. Only four. That shocked me. Now, there's a lot of stuff that's talked about in the New Testament, and I'm not saying that it's not true and it doesn't describe attributes and aspects of who God is, but when the, when the New Testament talks about God being holy, when the New Testament talks about God being a judge, when the New Testament, it, it uses adjectives and adverbs and stuff like that. There's, there's just four places where this God is phrase in the New Testament is followed by a noun, and we're going to look at them. God is fire that consumes. All right, so this is the, the verse that's in, Hebrews 12, 28 and 29. Therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. I just want, uh, consuming is, is a modifier of fire. So it describes the kind of fire. But the noun is fire. God is fire. And I want you to look at the context of this verse a little bit, which is why I included the one in uh, 28. This is not something, this concept of fire as it's introduced, is quoted out of Deuteronomy, and it's not something that is primarily the way we think of fire being uh, a condemning, judging thing. It says, since we receive a kingdom, the significance of God being a consuming fire is because you and I have been offered a kingdom. And it's a kingdom which cannot be shaken. So that plays into our understanding of what God is and why the fact that he is consuming fire is notable, significant, and plays about a 20% role in who the New Testament reveals God to be. Okay? So let me just read one more time. Therefore, since we receive a kingdom which God cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. So we could take this to say, we should be thanking God that he's giving us an unshakable kingdom. And that's pretty easy to think, right? Thank you, Lord, for giving us an unshakable kingdom. How many of you know people or yourself who are accustomed to saying, thank you, God, that you're a consuming fire? <laughs> See, we miss the whole point. Because the kingdom is an extension of God. It's not God. But God himself is the consuming fire that is given to us as the king of that kingdom. And so we should be able to embrace that and, and uh, be grateful for it. All right, here it is about spirit. This is Jesus speaking to the woman at the well. And she's inquiring about worship and him. And this is the place where, if you remember, Jesus was bold. And uh, uh, it, when I finally saw the scripture, it dispelled that notion that had been driven into me in Bible college that Jesus was hiding himself all the time. He was hiding himself to people who weren't looking. But to people who were looking, he was very bold. In this conversation with this woman, she said, I know when the Messiah comes, he's going to reveal all these things. And Jesus said, I who speak to you am he. That's not hiding. That's being pretty direct. I who speak to you am he. He, he was very clearly declaring himself so. So this is, again, another one of these open, giving, loving declarations but an hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Not because it's a law, but because it's who he is. God is spirit. And therefore we must worship in spirit and in truth. Now, I'm, I'm not going to be trying to exhaust these scriptures tonight because I can't, and especially when we get into the application ones. I just want to stir up our thinking about the significance of who God is and what God is and why we're doing that. So, next is light. This is in 1 John 
chapter 1, verse 5, this is the message we have heard from him and announced to you, that God is light, and in him there's no darkness at all. The hymn that John is referring to here, I believe, is Jesus, and uh, he's reflecting back on his time with him. And so as part of the revelation of the Father and of who Jesus uh, revealed God to be, he was revealed as light. And we'll look at a couple of those situations in a bit, but God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. Okay? God is light. And then love. First John chapter 4, the one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. So stop there for a second. That's another one of those, those statements, which if we don't understand that what's being declared here is, is who God is. The, the ontological essence of God, the nature of God, who he's made up, what he's made up of, it's not a rule. It's not a law saying, shame on you if you don't love somebody, because if you don't love somebody, you're not going to know God. God is love. And to love is to know God, and not to love is to not know God. It's just that simple. Uh, it's just that simple. By this, the love of God was manifest in us, that God has sent his only son, his only begotten son, into the world so that we might live through him. So once again, we're looking at a kind of an exclusive situation here. God is love, and if you don't love, you don't know God. And this love motivated God to send his son to us, his only begotten son, right? So that the world can live through him. There's not life in another. That's why knowing this is really important. Then the double dose comes further down the chapter. We have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. God is love. And the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this, love is perfected with us so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so also are we in this world. There's so much in this verse. So much in this verse. But the idea that God is love, the fact that it's repeated twice, I might be making too big a deal of it. But I do believe the Holy Spirit inspires the Scriptures. I do believe things were chosen precisely. I do believe there was inspiration flowing into the writers, the apostles, and so on. And there's only four nouns associated with God. And this one is associated with him after the phrase, God is. And so the point of this all being special is that God is is a declarative statement. And nouns following a declarative statement are statements of being of that declaration. In Hebrews chapter 11, it says, without faith it's impossible to please God. And we've turned that into a work too. Because it says that he who comes to God must believe that he is. That's a declarative statement. God, you are. Or as God would put it, I am. <laughs> This is the centerpiece of knowing who God is. This is how God introduced himself to Moses. And by the way, it was fire, right, that pulled him off the trail. The bush that was burning but wasn't consumed. And don't let that trip you up over God is a consuming fire. We won't get there tonight, but we'll get there. Um, God is love, and the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. Not as a work not as a matter of law-keeping, but because that's who God is. You can't love. Now, this is something that's true. And this, this was very different than I was taught when I was uh, a young guy in uh, a couple of theological camps. Because the fundamental understanding of the world in that, those theological systems was that the fall caused men to be utterly separated from God, dead and depraved, then love could not be associated with God unless it was associated with him in the name of the gospel. So the love that a mother has for a child in a pagan nation, we couldn't give that any credit. And we missed out on a lot of understanding about what God was doing. And I'm not saying that, that uh, there, there isn't a need and, and, a, and a life-giving value for knowing who God is and, and knowing Jesus and all that. There's one name under uh, heaven where we can be saved. I believe that with all my heart. 
But, but the, the understanding that God is love and that love flows from Him. We love because He first loved us. We're going to look at that passage in just a second. That's where it comes from. He, not that. He is where love comes from. So when you see love, when you experience love, when you feel love, and when you receive love, God is manifest in that. Otherwise, we have to come up with an entirely different place where love comes from. And there's no indication in the Scripture that the devil helps us love. And there's no indication that men come up with it on their own. So we have to give it credit. I'm not talking redemptive. I'm not talking any of that. I'm talking essence. Essence. When you see love, when you experience love, when you observe love, you are seeing the nature and the essence of who God is manifesting among humanity. And we need to give it some credit. We need to understand it. We need to treat it with the respect that love deserves because God is love. Now, the other thing I want to pull out of this one verse is look how important this is. Love is perfected with us so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment. Remember I said at the beginning that far too often when we think about eternal life and we think about the afterlife and we think about judgment and we think about our disposition, where are we going to go and what are we going to do, we're not thinking in terms of being in love. We're thinking in terms of being in heaven or we're thinking in terms of being purified somehow or we're thinking in terms of avoiding eternal torment or avoiding burning. But right here, by this love is perfected with us and the reason that is given in the context of declaring God is love is so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment. Earlier one, the one earlier uh, back here, matter of fact, I'll just go back to it. He gave his only begotten son out of a motive of love so that we would receive life. And when we in that life love and experience love and watch love and see love, it's because of this gift. And then this creates the confidence that we have as we look forward to eternity. Okay. Now, I think for most people and most believers that God or the heart of God is kind of, it looks like that. It's kind of vague. And it's open to all kinds of, of uh, interpretation. And if you start trying to deduce the nature of the heart of God, and I'm not saying the heart of God is dark, I'm saying it's opaque. It's that we don't, we understand he's bigger than we are. He's infinite. And so to me, if we have these four bright points of light, we should do something with them. We should give them weight and value. And that's why we talk about it all the time, that God is spirit and God is fire and God is light and God is love, love. And so I think a lot of people, when they, are pressed in their own heart, in their own spirit. What's God like? They have hopes, but it's fuzzy. But now we have these points. He's fire. He's spirit. He's light. And he's love and love. So what does that mean? What does that mean? All right. I don't want us... I don't want us just to accept this as sort of a novel definition and then revert back into deduction to try to figure out, well, because maybe he causes the rain to fall on the just and the unjust. These are all true things. and I'm not saying that they're not worth studying, they're not worth pondering, but what I am saying is that there are some direct correlations in Scripture, and these are the things that keep coming out for me. I didn't see all these at the first place. We haven't talked about all of them even here yet, but I just want to power through a few scriptures to show you the implications that might be within our understanding about the fact that God is fire, spirit, light, all undergirded by, all wrapped up in, all bracketed by love and love. Okay? So here's the first one. Since God is fire that consumes, here's a passage that I want us to think about. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 12-15. Paul's talking about 
himself. He's talking about other believers. He's talking about other ministers. He's talking about building on the foundation that is Christ. Okay? He's talking about the works of our life, the works of your life and my life. What are we, what are we doing? What are we believing? What are we building? How are we loving? How are we serving? Whatever. Now, if any man builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each man's work will become evident, for the day will show it because it is to be revealed with fire. And the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work, which he has built on it, on the foundation of Jesus, remains, he will receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. Now, this sounds like judgment to me. Does it to you? But if God is the consuming fire that tests a person's works, your works and my works, and then I remember one day I had a whoa God statement. You mean blood-washed, repentant, forgiven me is going to be tested by fire? Yes. Now, we don't preach about it a lot. But Jesus said, every man's works are going to be tested by fire. You see how this is an entirely different thing if it's some kind of judicial, judgmental, infernal, rather than it's God himself? And don't let me forget to emphasize one super point. When we're talking about, well, I'll just do it now, then I won't forget when we're talking about what God is, so God is spirit, he is fire, he is light, and he is love, love. He is not, and it's super important that, that you think this out and embrace it. It is not accurate to say that by discovering these things or by the scripture revealing them, it means that he's part spirit and part fire, and part light, and part love, and another part love. That's not how what you is works. He is all fire, all spirit, all light, all love, all love, all at the same time. And these aren't things he does fundamentally or primarily. And I know this will sound weird too. Because it, it, it calls on us to change the way we think. So if you, you say, does God love me? God is love with you and to you. Yes, I think it's okay to say he loves you. Does he shine light into my air, uh, light? Yeah, I think he does. You know, does he spirit me? I wouldn't even know what that meant. So that one's an easier one to understand. It, these aren't things God chooses to do. This is who he is. So when you bump into God, you are simultaneously bumping into love, spirit, fire, light, and love again. You're wrapped in those things. Now, your reaction to that, your experience in that, as we're going to see in just a second, might be very different than the person next to you. Because somebody might be in a position to just kind of be like a little child and be wrapped in that. This two brackets of love consuming me in, in spirit and in, in light and in fire. Somebody else may go, ow. I don't know that I like that. But that's not, that's not how God, that's not what he's going to react to. Because this isn't what he's doing. This is who he is. And if we can ever get that thought down, to me, that's the most liberating thought about this whole thing. You are always doing that. I can never experience your fire independent of experiencing your love. Now, I may only feel the fire, and the love may seem a million miles away, but that's only because I'm holding on to that wood, hay, and stubble thinking it's something of value. See what I'm saying? Okay.
In Zechariah, it says, God says this through the prophet. Jerusalem will be inhabited without walls because of the multitude of men and cattle within it. For I, declares the Lord, will be a wall of fire around her, and I will be the glory in her midst. Do you see how that reinforces the idea? Not that God uses fire, that he is fire. I will be a wall of fire around Jerusalem and the glory in her midst. So think about this. He was talking about the city being protected. That means that nobody was going to get into Jerusalem with bad intentions, without passing through the fire. I don't have time to teach on it tonight, but I think I I will in the not-too-distant future. Uh, This whole idea of of, of fire is carried over to the idea of the the Valley of Hinnom, that that it's like a, a, a fire around Jerusalem. And if it's God going around lighting fires to protect the people on the inside, that's one thing. But if it's God himself that says, I will stand as a watchman and no one will come to you except through me, which, in, which means they've got to contend with my love, my spirit, my light, my fire, and my love. It changes everything to me. It changes everything about who God is, where he is. And you can see this even if you think about... Uh, Israel traveling with the tabernacle because God was the fire in the midst. He was the fire, uh, a, a pillar of fire above the, the tent of meeting, and he was the fire on the mountain. That was him, him, not what he did. Not, he didn't send a fire. He didn't stoke a fire. And then when, when um, I think it was uh, Elijah was feeling, you know, coming up against the prophets of Baal, Fire came down from heaven, right, to consume that thing. If we think that that's God and not something he shoots out of a flamethrower, that makes that an entirely different experience. And then all the, the stuff that, that uh, um, I'm not sure what it, it is. Anyway, all the stuff that they did about mocking. Where's your God? Is he often doing the bathroom? See, this is an, an issue of presence, not an issue of tools. Presence. Presence. Okay? Jesus, I, don't, I, don't, I couldn't tell you if my life depended on it, what he means here. But I think it's a fascinating statement, and I've never heard anybody preach on it. I have come to cast fire upon the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. Has that ever stumbled you a little bit? Like, Because obviously Jesus was having a hard time in this section. If you read that, that passage there in Luke, uh, he's been hammered on by the Pharisees. He's trying to tell some stuff about, uh, you think I came to bring peace? No, I came to bring division. You know, a family of five is going to be divided against one another, three to two. And his disciples said, are you just talking about us? Or are you talking about the rest of the world? And he finally goes, I've come to cast fire upon the earth. And how I wish it were already kindled. But I have a baptism to undergo and how distressed I am until it's accomplished. So if we don't understand that Jesus may in fact be talking in his passion for the release of the very presence of God on the earth, not some kind of fiery rebuttal to his frustration over people not getting the message, but he came, I want the fire to be kindled. I don't know. I don't know what it means, but it's exciting to me. All right, how about this one? One last time, because God is fire. John says, as for me, John the Baptist, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, and I am not fit to remove his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clear his threshing floor, and he will gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with an unquenchable fire. Is it possible that in an intimate, contact-based relationship with the presence of God, who is fire, is it possible that the chaff won't be able to survive in our lives? Is it possible that heaven is a place where righteousness dwells and and the chaff represents that which is worthless or unrighteous or the straw, hay, and stubble we heard about in 1 Corinthians chapter 3? And 
rather than us worrying about having to be ashamed in heaven and having to have some kind of Jesus shield in front of us all the time, we might actually be clean enough because God is a consuming fire just by the fact that we're being drawn by his love, illuminated by his light, penetrated to our core by his spirit that we might actually belong there and be able to walk around with our head held high. And when we, when we see the glory coming over the horizon from the, city of the, of the, the center of the city, instead of wondering if we need to check ourselves or hide behind something, we can run. We can run to that throne of grace. I don't know. I think it's amazing. I do. I do. And unquenchable fire. Well, of course it's unquenchable. If it's Him, He's eternal, right? He's infinite. There's no place it can't reach. There's no place it can't go. So right at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, we have to come to grips with the fact that He was either saying, my dad is a firebug, and He's going to flame on you, or my dad is fire wrapped in love, illuminated in light, carried in spirit. I think it's a whole different ballgame. So here we go. Now we can begin to add some texture and some understanding, I think, to our thoughts about God, if we will. And I'm encouraging you to, and you don't have to take my thoughts, but I'll just throw them up here. God himself is the one that tests every man's works. He doesn't do it remotely in a furnace room someplace. It is him Everybody passes before him. We'll see that in the Spirit in a second. God himself is a wall of fire and protection. He doesn't build one. He doesn't send us burning angels. I'm not saying there aren't burning angels, and I'm not saying they don't play a role in it. My guess is angels are pretty fiery, because it says that Jesus is coming back with fiery angels. But where are they getting their fire? They don't have a fire depot or the fire station over there in heaven where they go ignite themselves and keep running. (laughs) they live in the presence of the one who is fire. Jesus longed to kindle a fire. Could that be God himself? Could it be just we didn't get a glimpse of him in a frustrating moment there where he'd like to smoke everybody? I think so. God himself, the Holy Spirit, and fire unquenchable. And should we ever have doubted that the baptism of the Holy Spirit that Jesus was bringing was God himself? Should we ever have a doubt that Pentecost was that? Never. Never. All right. Here, since God is spirit, look at this verse. This is in Hebrews chapter 4. I love it. For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit, of both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight. But all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. I grew up in a tradition that taught that the first half of this, verse 12, talked about the Bible and the the power that the Bible had to separate the motives of our heart and all this kind of stuff. And then my tradition ignored the second part. They didn't really try to ignore it, but they didn't acknowledge that it says, and there are no creatures hidden from his sight, not its sight. This is an it. The word of God is a him, not a H Y M N N M. A him, an H I M. Okay? So let's read it again and think about this being Jesus. Think about this being God. And that was one of the other interesting things that that this understanding is beginning to help do. It's helping in my heart, in the heart of people that I talk with, reintegrate the persons of the Trinity into an understanding of one God. That Jesus is God, that the Holy Spirit is God, that the Father is God, that God is God, that Elohim is God. Okay, So, for the Word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit of both joint and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. Why? Because 
God is spirit. And he connects. He is inside with our spirit. His essence is at one with our spirit. It's not a foreign thing. He doesn't have to look on the outside and judge from the outside. So I'm not sure that I even at all understand the magnitude of this, but the fact that he is spirit gives him some incredible access. We'll see it in just a second. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Now, I think that's a wonderful verse. It's a magnificent, it's, it's powerful, it's confusing. You go on a little bit from here. It says, therefore, since we have a high priest who's passed through the heavens, let us approach uh, boldly the throne of grace to find grace to help in time of need. So it's that section there in chapter four. But I think because God is spirit, our spirit is no place to hide. It's no refuge from his gaze. Here's another one. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. But just as it is written, things which eye has not seen and ear has not heard and which have not entered into the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him. For to us, God has revealed them through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. For who among men know the thoughts of a man except the spirit of a man which is in him? Even so, the thoughts of God no one knows except the Spirit of God. So, Whatever else this means, and I'm sure it means a ton, it reveals to me that the fact that God is spirit means that that communion of being led by the spirit, of having the spirit cry out, Abba, Father, in us, it literally connects us not just with what he does, but with who he is. And the spirit, as we commune spirit to spirit, God's essence, his existence, who he is is being revealed to us, not just the things he does, not just a, a view from the outside. So I think the Spirit's pretty significant. So I kind of characterize that one as God himself can penetrate into our spirits. No hiding, everything's being revealed. And again, this goes back and begins, I think if you think about it, or something like this, it begins to change what our expectations are as we anticipate heaven. Because heaven is not going to be a place where there's any hiddenness. It's not going to be a place where there's any distance. There's nothing to be covered over. There's nothing to be ashamed. Everything is spirit to spirit open, connected. All right. How about since God is light? This one just, I, I love this one. So Jesus, and again, we should really let Jesus define things before we embrace too firm a doctrine about it. Jesus said this about judgment in John chapter 3. This is the judgment. Now, I want us, if we will, to at least embrace the language that pretends that we believe that Jesus said this. In other words, when somebody asked you in some kind of conversation, well, God's the judge, right? You go, absolutely. And this is the judgment. <laughs> that light has come into the world, and men love the darkness rather than light, for their deeds were evil. Then it goes down a verse or two. But he who practices the truth comes to the light. Now, I appreciate that the New American Standard capitalized light here, because it shows me that somebody on the translation team figured out that God is light. Because they don't do that in the, in the Greek manuscript. This is judgment that light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light for their deeds are evil. But he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifest. And look at what they're manifest as. As being good? No. As being in conformity to the law? No. As being wise? No. As being literally wrought, manufactured, shaped from God, by God. So you come to the light, who are you coming to? You're coming to God. You hide from the light, who are you hiding from? You're hiding from God. This is why the personalization of these statements of being, to me, seems so incredibly important. Here's John 
prologue, starting in verse 4. In him, Jesus, the word, the logos, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. The life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There came a man sent from John, whose name was, from God, whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify about the light so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. And then it says, there was the true light, which coming into the world enlightens every man. Light coming into the world. Don't think about it like a spotlight or a flashlight or one of those searchlight beams even. That's, I think, the way we, we have a tendency. We magnify whatever the images we have. You don't have to magnify light. God is light. God came into this world. We know that's what it says in the prologue. But light, it, 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 it's, it's better. So, God himself. Judgment is light come into the world. But, not as an act. As a presence. And we could see this in the Genesis story. Adam sinned. Right? He became afraid. And when God's presence came, he felt the judgment. And he hid. And God said, Adam, where are you? Did, did God come to judge? No. Light judged. Presence judged. So, when you think about judgment, when you think about, and, and, and you have those, hopefully, fading images of the chick tracks of the 70s, uh, with God behind a throne, no face, a uh, lightning bolt in one hand, and, or a gavel in another. When you think about judgment like that, or when you think about standing there sheepishly in front of this massive throne, right? And that judgment becomes an act from that throne toward you. In spite of the fact, in spite of the fact that the Spirit causes us to pass through God so that we have the confidence to go boldly before that throne of grace to receive help and grace in time of need. See, it's all messed up. But if you, don't, if you won't think about that throne being a throne, but you think about that light being God. And so the thing that you feared being exposed, guess what? It is. But it's exposed just as much to spirit, so it's all the way inside. Just as much to fire, so whatever dirty thing is shown up by the light, God is perfectly equipped to smoke out of you. Not as an act of judgment, as a presence of life, a presence of judgment. And it's all just as laced with love as it is every other aspect. And I don't even know the ramifications of that. I don't know how to really check it out. But it, judgment is light come into the world, not as an act, not as an edict, not as a declaration, as a presence. Does that make sense? I think that'll change the way... I think it'll change the way we feel about judgment, to tell you the truth. Since God is love... For God so loved the world that He gave. His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send His Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through Him. A little bit later, Jesus says, the Father judges no one, but given all judgment into the hands of the Son. And then a little later still, He said, I didn't come to judge the cosmos. I came to save it. And then, in I think it's John 13, He makes this amazing statement. He says, if you don't do the words that I say, I'm not going to judge you. The words themselves are going to judge you. Why? Because they are spirit and life, right? They're presence. They're light. So, because God is love, we understand why He is who He is and does what He does. And what He did was send His Son. And then here's this one. This is a little bit later. 
All these other uh, scriptures I pulled out of the New American Standard, but I just, I, I got frustrated because I usually try to look at this stuff a little bit in the original language. And one of my pet peeves, if you know me, is when we don't translate simple words the way they're supposed to be. And so there's a word in this thing in, uh, matter of fact, I'll read it to you out of New American Standard real quick and then we're, we're done. We're real close to done. Um, so here it is in the New American Standard. Uh, I've lost. Oh, there it is. We have come to know and to believe the love which God has for us. God is love, and the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this, love is perfected so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves punishment, and the one who fears is not perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. There was a word there, ain, which is to be translated, should be almost every time, in, but it the, the way the New American Standard, it left it open to a sense of separation. So in the Mirror Bible, it reads like this. And thus we have come to know and believe the love that God has unveiled within us, not has for us or has given to us. It's a huge difference. Ain is a simple word. It means in. And it's right smack dab in the middle of this. We have come to know and to believe the love that God has unveiled within us. A lot of people are not very moved forward by the love that God has for them because they don't believe they're worthy of it. They don't believe that it it's going to be able to find its way in them because of all the other mess. Paul said something that's very powerful. He said, when it pleased the Father to reveal His Son in me. In me. Not to me. It's ain't. So there's something to be said for knowing that this is relational. And this love idea is not, again, it's not something that God first chooses to do. It is something that God first is. So the revelation of love in us is the revelation of God in us. And we live like orphans because we think he has a love out there someplace beyond the border fence. But we just haven't got it yet. So I think it's, I think it's a big deal. It's a beautiful verse. It says, And thus we have come to know and believe the love that God has unveiled within us. God is love. Love is who God is. To live in this place of conscious, constant love is to live immersed in God and to feel perfectly at home in His indwelling. I just want to admonish us. There's enough evidence in the Scripture about who God is and how who He is creates an intimate kind of interface with us that I don't think you can go wrong by believing that this is relationship from the inside of you out. And that's kind of the reason why we emphasize that this is who God is. Does that make sense? Okay. So God himself is love and we are and can be immersed in him. Now, this is just a bonus. I've started looking in the Old Testament, and the first one I was able to find was here in Isaiah chapter 12. Behold, God is my salvation. Now, I don't know enough about Hebrew yet to know how to parse it out. I know the is is not there in the language, but it may be implied by the tense. I don't know how to deal with that. And then also, but I, but I was stunned thinking relationally about God is when I realized what the word for salvation was. God Actually, behold, God is Yeshua. If that doesn't give you goosebumps at some point when it hits you, call for prayer. God is 
Yeshua. Well, of course he is. Of course he is. All right. That's it, guys.